my name is Stefan, and uh, from the introduction, uh, I'm from Astro Pontiac, uh, and so in, in normal times, um, we would be known for hosting free astronomy evenings near the Luskville entrance to Gatineau Park. Uh, we always have at least one telescope for visitors, and uh, volunteers from the community will often come and bring their equipment as well. Sometimes we ha actually have up to a dozen telescopes on uh, an evening to offer. So if visitors come by, you'll see a lot of amateur astronomers there sharing their equipment. But on the, on the open evenings, we always have at least one nice telescope uh, in, in our observatory for people to come by and see. We also have a mobile planetarium that we bring to schools and community groups all around the region. And these planetarium shows are offered at a reasonable price to help us cover our operating costs. So as we all know, these aren't normal times. So both our observatory and our planetarium activities are on hiatus, but this is a great moment to get outside and enjoy time with some of the people closest to us. And astronomy is a great way to spend an evening. You might think astronomers need telescopes to enjoy an evening under the night sky, but sometimes a comfy chair, a blanket, and some hot cocoa are all that you really need. If you have some binoculars, that's an added bonus. So tonight we're going to look at some of the objects you can explore without a lot of fancy equipment. Uh, we'll take a look uh, at our solar system and the ecliptic. Uh, we'll also take a tour around the northern sky will turn away from just the north and look at some of the highlights that appear in the sky above us and also maybe just make a wish because there are a couple of uh, meteor showers in December that might just be worth looking up for. So from the outside uh, of, our, uh, of our solar system, the path of the planets uh, around the sun appears to be almost along a flat plane, a bit like a dinner plate with a couple of wobbles for each planet's own orbit. Comets and other, uh, and other objects can follow pretty eccentric paths. And so looking at it from the outside, let's think about what that means uh, for our spot, looking up at the heavens from Earth in the Northern Hemisphere. So this image captures the rotation of each planet on its axis, as well as Pluto, in relation to that plane across the solar system that I was talking about. <laughs> For Earth, you can see my pointer, uh, that, uh, that slight axis is the reason for our seasons, with the sun higher and its light more direct in the summer, and the opposite in the winter, which brings the cooler temperatures. Uh, you'll also see later in the presentation that at this time of year, that imaginary plane of the solar system rises higher in the evening because the sun is lower in the day. So this makes the evening planets and our moon appear to rise even higher in the sky than in the summer. The name for the imaginary line that traces uh, across the sky that traces the plane of our solar system is the ecliptic. It's a bit like Earth's equator, that imaginary line that sort of traces its way around the girth of our planet. And as you can see, a lot of planets rotate in a way kind of like Earth that's close to being on the ecliptic. But day and night and watching the night sky would be a very different experience on Uranus or Pluto. Here's Uranus. And perhaps you can see that it's actually rotating perpendicular to our rotation. And Pluto as well has a very eccentric rotation. So their rotations uh, look to us almost as if they're tumbling through the sky. And on Venus, here, its rotation is actually opposite uh, to, mo to most of the other planets. 
it would look like the sun rose in the west and set in the east. So this slide uh, allows us to follow the sun across the sky to show us how to find the ecliptic. Just remember, don't look directly at the sun, um, and definitely not through binoculars or a telescope. You'll do some serious damage to your eyes. But these images trace the path of the sun hour by hour as it uh, sets on a late November evening. And this green line that you'll see getting brighter and brighter as the sunlight disappears represents that ecliptic that I was talking about. And as the sun goes down, you can see it slowly kicking up a little bit higher in the sky because that nighttime ecliptic rises higher in the winter months. And so this series of images uh, represents the changes day by day, uh, beginning tomorrow evening. So if you were to go out at about 6 p.m. tomorrow evening, just after sunset, this is the sky that you would see in sort of like facing the south, uh, looking for that ecliptic, that same line that the sun, uh, that the sun traced. So if you're looking for planets, like Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars here. They can be spotted as point, points of light, not too far off the ecliptic. You can see Mars is a little bit, is a tiny bit below, and Saturn and Jupiter are a little bit closer, not too far off. The moon also follows the ecliptic as well. It's, it will bobble up and down, depending on its orbit in relation to Earth. And so, the, the planets can be spotted as light, uh, not far from the ecliptic, and you can recognize them because they don't twinkle like stars tend to do. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn here, they're much closer to following the sun into the sunset over the horizon. Uh, they've been with us uh, through the summer months, uh, and they're still visible just after sunset uh, because uh, and because their orbits take many years to complete, we'll see them again around the same time of year next year. Now, if you happen to have a pair of binoculars, uh, Jupiter, uh, if you look in on it, will look like a golden disk uh, with four tiny points of light around it. These are the Galilean moons. And by Galilean moons, those were the moons that Galileo spotted uh, going around Jupiter when he first pointed his telescope up to the sky. And seeing the moons go around Jupiter was a revolutionary, literally a revolutionary experience. Because up until that point, we thought that the Earth was the center of the universe. The sun, the planets, and the stars were supposed to go around us, and we were the center of everything. It was Earth-shaking, literally, for uh, Galileo to point his telescope up and see that these moons were actually going around Jupiter because if the, if things were going around Jupiter, maybe Earth wasn't quite the center, the foundation that we thought it was. And then uh, uh, we're lucky for finding uh, for finding Saturn uh, this time of year because these orbits will will start to get further and further apart uh, as the years go by. But for now, they look closer together from Earth uh, than, than they often are. Uh, but if you look at Saturn uh, with binoculars, you won't see the famous rings. But what you could maybe see is instead of being a circular disk like Jupiter would be, you might see Saturn just being a little bit of an oblong, and that would be just a hint of the rings uh, that you would see. And um, further along the ecliptic, here is Mars. And Mars, uh, with binoculars, oh, without binoculars, Mars uh, looks like an ember in the sky. It's really one of the more striking things uh, to look at in the solar system. 
And then if you pull out the binoculars and uh, turn, to, turn to the planet, it looks again like a disk. Uh, and that's why we say that the planets don't twinkle because they're not just points of light like the stars are to us. They are actual disks and our, and our eyes can sort of tell they're like that. Uh, and so they're not twinkly, uh, but the binoculars help that pop and a telescope will really help that pop. Uh, and so you'll see a golden reddish disk for Mars. Now Mars uh, is closer to us than Saturn and Jupiter are and closer to the sun. Uh, so that means that its orbit is much shorter than uh, Saturn and Jupiter. Because Saturn and Jupiter move so slowly around the sun, we'll catch up to them roughly once a year. But Mars goes around the sun uh, once every two years or so. So a Martian year is about two years. So M Mars, having been brightest in October, will, won't be that bright to us again until 26 months from now. So we'll actually go through a year next, next year where we don't see Mars at all. And then 26 months from now, we'll, we'll see Mars again, just because it takes that time for us to catch up with its orbit. And I haven't talked too much about the moon because what I want to do is show you sort of like how each, each passing day uh, changes the moon in the moon's orbit around us, its position related to the sun, where we'll see it in the sky and also how full it becomes. So again, this is, this is what, uh, what you'd see if you, if you looked up uh, tomorrow evening around 6 p.m. And then the next day, the moon starts a little bit further back from the setting sun and it gets a little bit fuller. And then it starts to move again It'll start to appear at 6 p.m. It'll be here in the sky in the next day. And you can see slowly it's getting fuller and fuller, fuller. And that's because the moon goes around the Earth just about every, uh, every four weeks. And over that time, there's two weeks where it spends uh, waxing, getting fuller and fuller until it gets full. Uh, and that's when the moon compared to us is opposite the sun and it's catching the full sunlight and reflecting that full sunlight towards us. And then it will start another period of about two weeks of waning where it rises again, further and further back in the night sky so that it rises later and later at night, getting closer and closer to the sun. And then when it's between us and the sun, that's the new moon. And so we don't see any light. Now the period for me that I love the most is just after the new moon and you get uh, a tiny fine crescent uh, of the moon's light. And I'll show you in the next slide about a phenomenon called earth shine, which again is, is something you don't need binoculars or a telescope to see. And it's one of the most moving things if you know what to look for. It's literally the, the light of the earth shining off of our surface and then reflecting back onto the moon, the dark face of the moon. And it's kind of like how um, the moon can, the full moon can light up an, an evening sky for us. This is Earth's light shining in, and reflecting off of the face of the moon. And then I'm just going to run back a little bit so that you can see that the moon is sort of stealing the show here. But if you look at Saturn and Jupiter, this is why I'm saying that slowly we're not going to have a chance to see them because every passing evening, they're coming out just a little bit closer to the horizon. And then, yeah, Saturn and Jupiter closer to the horizon as we see around the solar system. I just don't want you guys to miss anything. And then if you're... If you're looking at the moon, here is a bit of a, a bit of a representation of what Earth shine looks like. Of course, we wouldn't see it like this with the naked eye, but you can clearly see that the, that 
that the face of the moon is being illuminated by something other than the light here that's coming from the sun. And if you have a pair of binoculars, this giant crater, the Tycho crater, is something that you can look for and pretty easily identify. And if the moon is closer to its, uh, closer to being a bigger crescent, or even in its first quarter where half of the surface is lit up, then uh, you could look for the spot where the daytime and nighttime of the moon are meeting, and that's called the terminator. And it's just like uh, how, just like how uh, shadows get much longer at sunset and sunrise uh, on Earth, if you're looking at the terminator, you're looking basically at the division between sunset and sunrise. And because of that, you get a really good sense of, the long, of those long shadows and the relief that's on the moon's surface so that it, you can see that it's a bumpy surface and it doesn't look like that flat disk that, that we see when, when we're looking up at the moon with our own eyes. So now onto the northern sky. Because of our latitude above the tropics, uh, the ecliptic uh, is, some, is always somewhat towards the south. If you were looking, if, if we were hanging out in um, Argentina, Chile, or South Africa, Namibia, we would actually have to look north to see the ecliptic because uh, our axis of the Earth and our rotation is almost in line with it. So our equator is pretty close to the ecliptic. And, and so if you go further south, then you're looking north of the ecliptic. But from where we are, uh, we're, looking, we're always looking a little bit to the south, no matter the time of year. So even at the height of summer, uh, the sun is never quite overhead. Uh, and the north faces of our houses are always cooler and shader, shaded. So turning our backs to the ecliptic, uh, we face north. And so because of our latitude, the northern constellations are visible throughout the evening and throughout the year. With each passing season, they begin the evening in a different corner of the night sky, but they circulate around Polaris, the North Star, they circulate around Polaris, the North Star, which sits almost directly above the North Pole. Uh, this series of images uh, will show the hour by hour change in the night sky on a late November evening, starting just after sunset. Polaris is found in the constellation Ursa Minor, the little bear, and it's also called the little dipper because it just looks like a lovely little panhandle here. And another fun uh, constellation to point out is Cassiopeia. To me, Cassiopeia looks like a pretty unmistakable W shape. Also, you can see here Ursa Major, the Great Bear. But what we know in Ursa Major for most people is just taking this part here is our Big Dipper. So the Big Dipper gives us Ursa Major. The, the North Star gives us the Little Dipper and Ursa Minor, and just sort of opposite, here you can catch that W of Cassiopeia. So the story for Cassiopeia is that uh, she, was, uh, she was beautiful and she was also boastful. And she kept on boasting that she and her daughter were more beautiful than the divine Nereids in, in Greek mythology. So this brought the wrath of the sea god Poseidon and he threatened their kingdom with the sea monster Cetus. So, uh, and so sending Cetus to destroy the kingdom and, uh, and Cassiopeia and her husband consulted with, uh, with an oracle and the oracle said, yes, we can save the kingdom, but only if you... Uh, if you sacrifice your daughter Andromeda to, uh, to Cetus, the sea monster. So they made the choice and they said, our kingdom is worth more than our daughter. And they strapped her to a stone 
and they left her for Cetus to, to take as a sacrifice. Poor, Cass, uh, poor Andromeda, she, she, she saw Cetus coming, and just in the nick of time, Perseus decides to come out of the sky on Pegasus and kill Cetus, saves Andromeda, impresses her so much that she marries him. But it's not, it's not all fun and games for Cassiopeia because, uh, because uh, uh, Perseus says, you know, you should pay a price for the choice you made. So they sat her in the sky on what's supposed to be a chair, but to me looks like a W, but that's supposed to be Cassiopeia in her chair, always having to face her daughter just out of view, Andromeda. Don't worry, we'll get to see Andromeda a little bit later. But always getting a chance, but always facing Andromeda and having to look at her daughter and reflect on her choice. So I'm just going to take you through, and instead of that east to west that you get as you're looking at the most of the sky, when you're looking towards the pole, you'll start to see this churn hour by hour. And you can see as the night passes that these constellations move through the sky. So you remember I told you about just isolating that part of the Big Dipper, and with the edge of the pan of the Big Dipper, if you follow that out to, the, to a bright point of light, that will be your Polaris. You don't have to be in the country to do this. You can't be in downtown Ottawa or Gatineau. But if you get a little bit out, even in even in like Aylmer or uh, Canada, uh, you can easily do this. You don't lose you don't lose uh, enough of the stars that this won't work. And you can sh you can show your friends and your family and impress them by sh showing them where the North Star is. And the North Star is also good for navigation because it sits above our pole. So if you if you take the angle between the North Star and the ground, that should also give you your latitude. So if you're ever caught on a ship, uh, maybe you won't be able to find land, but at least you'll know uh, how far from the equator you are. Okay. So I rem uh, you remember I, I, I teased you about meteor showers. So I'm going to take you through the meteor shower part of the presentation, and then I'll give you a bit of a tour of the night sky with a different program so that you can be able to find where these meteors are coming from. But first, to tell you about meteors, a meteor is a space rock that enters the Earth's atmosphere. And as that tiny uh, bit of rock falls towards the Earth, the resistance of the air on that rock makes it extremely hot, and that superheats the air around it. And so what we see is that shooting star. So the bright streak isn't that actually that rock. It's the glowing hot air that uh, the hot rock uh, uh, causes as it speeds through the atmosphere. And so this winter in December, if you're brave and also you're willing to stay up late, uh, there's a couple of meteor showers worth noting. Uh, your best bet is probably the Geminids uh, and then the um, Ursids a little bit later in the month aren't quite as uh, bright and, uh, and regular as the Geminids. And unfortunately, um, neither of them is quite as dependable and visible over a, a long period as the Perseids that we know in the summer. During the summer, we always have some sort of event for the Perseids because they peak over several days. And so uh, you're, you're usually able to catch them if, if you can make some time and, and get out to a dark sky site. These ones, you have, to be in, you have to be out during a certain window of time to have your best chance of catching them. Uh, and the Ursids probably, if you're going to pick one, Geminids is the one, and the Ursids take it as, as, a, lucky, uh, as a lucky view if you, if you get the chance. This radiant here 
what what the radiant means is that is basically the point of the sky where it looks like those uh, meteors are are emerging from you don't have to look just at the radiant uh, 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 you could see some for like halfway across the sky but it will always you'll always be able to sort of like trace the tail of that shooting star back to this radiant point and why that is is because this radiant point is the point in our atmosphere that's actually facing those uh, facing those tiny bits of debris in space and is and is striking them and so they break away from from that kind of like water running off of your windshield if you don't have your wipers on in the rain so it, it will sort of like go like that from that radiant point so the annual geminid meteor shower is expected to produce the greatest number of meteors on the night of uh, December 13th running into the 14th. So Sunday night until dawn on Monday. And, the, uh, and so uh, these colorful meteors tend to be bright uh, and on a dark night free of moonlight, like we'll be lucky enough this year, you might be able to see as many as 50 meteors per hour. And depending on the year, because we can never really predict exactly how it will go, sometimes there's as many as 100 of these per hour. That's why I'm saying it's your best bet if you're, if you're going to give one of these to a shot. But you should remember that the best viewing is for, for the Geminids is probably about 2 in the morning, because that's when this radiant point will be as far ab as directly above us as possible. And so it's like we are looking through the windscreen as it's facing that rain in the shower of meteors. And then the Ursid meteor shower uh, runs about December 17th to 26th each year and always peaks around the December solstice. And so that'll be 20, uh, December 21st this year. And so, um, uh, so if you're, generally speaking, the Ursids are apparently a low key affair uh, and so you probably would be seeing a, less than half of the of the meteors uh, that you would be seeing in the Geminids, but the ones that you do see apparently are are quite striking. So, if if you if you're looking up and you catch a falling star uh, around the time of the Ursids, uh, you, you're, you're you're probably going to see a nice one. But I don't know if it's worth uh, getting your toes so cold late in the morning for for that. Uh, and so the radiant point, uh, you'll see that the, the small bear, or some minor is here, and then the great bear is here. So that's why they call these the Ursids, because they're, they're the bear meteor shower. And then the Geminids in with the twins. And I'll tell you a little bit about the twins uh, once I change programs. Now a new share. Okay. Um, all right. So if we were to go out uh, in the evening right about now, and we were to turn north, this is uh, the sky that, we'll, that, that we would likely see. Um, can you see my pointer when I put it here? Yes, we see it. Okay, perfect. So here you have Polaris. Here you have the outline of the Big Dipper. And again, we can trace that all the way up to Polaris. And I promised you some other highlights around the North Sky. So if we were going, if you were going to, 
Hey ya. All right. Let me end. So here we're going a little bit opposite. So we're following that line again, looking up, 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 and like opposite the Big Dipper to Polaris is Here we can see that W of Cassiopeia. And I promised you a, a bit of a, a chance to see Andromeda. So I'm going to pull up the labels. So here we bring Cassiopeia around. And here is Andromeda, who Cassiopeia has to always look, look at and uh, remember her shame, the shame of her choice. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit more into Andromeda. And the reason I'm doing this is because if you look at the, the two points, oh. if you look at the two points of that W and you follow the sharper W down, almost like an arrow, if you have a pair of binoculars and you follow that arrow towards Andromeda, you'll see with your binoculars, not quite anything as sharp as this, but it's a, it, you'll see a little patch of fuzzy light. And what that is, is the Andromeda galaxy. And that, that galaxy is the largest or the closest full galaxy to Earth. It's about 1 million light years away from us. And so the light that you're looking at from that faint fuzzy patch has been traveling towards our eyes for a million years. And it won't be a million light years away uh, forever. Actually, in several billion years time, Andromeda is and the, our own Milky Way are supposed to be creeping closer and closer and closer together. And eventually they'll merge and form a big super galaxy. But we won't be around for that. Not even sure if our own Earth will be around for that, but that would be a pretty amazing show to catch. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to take you back to that ecliptic. So we're going to turn away from that northern sky that I was talking to you about and go back to the path of the sun. And here is the ecliptic. And I'm going to change the date on us. So instead of November 20th, I'm going to bring us This is, now keep in mind, this is the same time in the evening, but each, we're going a, a day at a time through this. So if, if, if we were going to be out at 6 p.m. in January, January 8th is where we are now. I'm going to bring you to one of, for me, is one of my favorite constellations because if you were to actually take these lines away, I'm going to take away the lines. Options, constellations, big figures. These stars here, Betelgeuse you may have heard of because it's a red supergiant and they were wondering if it was going to explode not too long ago. But these stars here, you can make out shoulders, a belt, and a tunic for Orion the Hunter. And I'll bring back
I'll bring back those outlines for us. Okay. So even without, even quite without that, you can, you can make out the tunic, the, the, these lines of the outlines in the stick figures do help us, but you can, you can make out that he's, with the, with the fainter stars and the help of the lines, you can see that Orion is holding a club. And then if we want to get really fancy and do the overlay, Here you can see Orion's club holding the shield on his knees, and almost like the tunic here. And, we're, and we can play with this just a little bit. And here, just following behind Orion is Sirius, the, the brightest star in Canis Major. And so Sirius is supposed to be uh, one of uh, one of Orion's hunting, or Canis Major is supposed to be one of Orion's hunting dogs, and Sirius, the star in the dog's nose, is basically the brightest star in our night sky. Uh, and it's bright not because the star is the most luminous, but because it is a pretty luminous star, and it's not uh, as far from us compared to some of the other stars that we see in our night sky. So the combination of distance and brightness makes it uh, makes it the brightest star in our sky. It it twinkles. Uh, it start. It's so bright that it twinkles quite violently, and you can see that shimmering look of the twinkling that I talk about. That's the opposite of what a uh, planet uh, would do. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this one, but this is uh, uh, Lepus the hare, and Sirius is supposed to be helping out Orion by chasing after the hare. And a little bit further out, I'm going to take away the constellations again, just so I can do some hunting for you. Um, options, constellations, illustrations. Okay, before we leave Orion, I should show you one more thing. If you have binoculars, uh, it is really worthwhile. Really worthwhile to look just below these belt stars. And you should see a bit of a fuzz patch here with your binoculars. And what that is, it's not another galaxy, it's actually a cloud of interstellar gas, so gas that's just out in space, that recently condensed enough, and by recently I mean a few million years ago, but uh, recently condensed enough that several stars ignited inside it. And so what you're seeing is the left hour, leftover gas from where those stars were formed being blown off into space and also illuminated by those new stars that are only a few million years old. So we call this nebula in Orion, we call it a stellar nursery. And that's another one of the reasons. So Orion's story is cool, and the fact that this is where stars are being born is also uh, very interesting for me. So we're going to pull out just a little bit. And so Orion is supposed to be chasing. So here's Orion the hunter. Here, this cluster of stars uh, 
It's called the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. The story behind these stars, which look almost like a tiny dipper if you get a little bit closer to them. I'll bring in a little bit closer. I'll take off the label so it's just not so crowded. So you can see it almost looks like a tiny dipper compared to the big dipper and the little dipper. With the naked eye, most people can see six stars. If you're if you have very good eyesight, and they used to use used to use that as a test for warriors from Earth without with the unaided eye, you can see seven. Now the seven sisters were apparently. Uh, bathing in the woods when Orion caught sight of them and he fell madly in love with them. They didn't return the love and instead they decided to, uh, to, take, uh, to take flight. So they ran from Orion and Orion decided that he couldn't stop chasing them because he was so madly in love. And so as a result, they Let's, let's move, uh, move through a few hours just so that you can see. So because of that, they run through the sky and Orion is always chasing them for eternity. With his good friend Sirius. With his good friend Sirius and Elf. Now, I mentioned uh, the geminid meteors, and you're going to say, Stefan, how am I supposed to find these geminid meteors? You tell me that they're in a constellation, uh, but there's so many constellations out there, where do I even start to try and find them? So I'm going to bring in... So here is Orion. And not too far behind Orion are the Gemini, the twins. So the story behind the twins is that they're twins and they share the same mom, but not the same father. Apparently, the, the um, I think it was Pollux. Let me just double check my notes. Uh, Okay, so, so Pollux was the son of Zeus who uh, took advantage of the mom and uh, Castor was the mortal father of, of the other twin. And so they were, they, were, they were born together as twins are and uh, 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 Pollux started to wrestle with his twin's mortality and coming to grips with his twin's mortality said, Zeus, it's not fair that I'm immortal because you're my father and my brother isn't and I wanna be with my brother forever. So uh, Zeus said, okay, fine. I will put you up in the heavens. And so we have the twins, Gemini and they're known by these two bright stars, oops. Uh, let me get my hand thingy back. And now, now labels, I'll zoom in a little bit, but you can see. So if you have Orion here, which is the easy find, Betelgeuse is the reddish star on Orion's left shoulder. Sirius is down and to the left. The Gemini twins are up and to the left of Orion. So just above his shoulders. And I'll put on the star labels. And so this star is the, these two bright stars are together in the night sky. You won't, it's not easy to make out the rest of the constellations away from 
the brightest of stars. That's why I've I've just have the labels on the bright bright ones like Beetlejuice, Bellatrix, Pollux, and Castor. Uh, so these are the these are the brighter stars that have names, and so if, if they're labeled here, you should be able to find them. So just draw a line from the belt on Orion to Betelgeuse and follow that to about this part of the sky, and you'll see these two. And around here will be that radiant point for the uh, for the Geminid meteors. And so I'm just going to go back to my home spot again. And we're back to November 20th right now. And we're going to go back to this northern sky. And so when you're looking, if you have a chance and you're brave enough, you'll be looking in this spot around here for that radiant that I was talking about for the Ursids between the great bear and the little bear. So with that, I will So before I uh, before I get into um, questions or comments, I should actually um, I should actually share this with you. Uh, the the kind folks at uh, the Festival de Sable in Gatineau, we were working with them over the summer to. Um, uh, we were working with them in the summer to, um, uh, to to do an astronomy event at their annual uh, at their annual basically it's it's like sand sculpture festival, uh, but of course th there's uh, there's nothing that we can do with the public at at this time. So we did uh, in the spirit of sort of like doing astronomy from your own uh, uh, from your own home with what you have around and also uh, with the people that you love. Uh, we, they, were, they were able to help me with this video and this video talks about finding Mars, finding the North Star. So it's kind of like a condensed version of what we saw this evening, but also uh, it gives you a little bit of a shot of uh, our astronomy um, observatory that's in Luskville, Quebec. And so hopefully, uh, if, if you're interested, uh, and when things get better, uh, we'd love to have you out. Like, I, I'm just going to be so thrilled to have, like, the biggest astronomy party uh, that Luskville has seen uh, once we are out of this and, and just to see people. Because the real reason that I do astronomy, um, my daughter inspired me because she just brightened up when I showed her the moon and she was, like, four years old, and she realized that it wasn't just like this flat disc in the sky. Her face lit up and she said, that's bumpy daddy. And so just seeing that look on people's faces as they see the planets, the moon, Andromeda galaxy, nebula, star clusters, uh, it's, it's just so rewarding. And so, but we can't do that this year, but I could offer you this. Saturn, and you might be wondering, what can I see in Carmen? Well, if you look towards the ecliptic, the same path that the sun and the moon cross the sky, during the month of October, you'll see the planet Mars, the fourth planet from the sun. We pass close to Mars about once every 26 months. Mars is beautiful at this time of year, as it looks like an ember in the sky. With binoculars, it looks like a red disc. Also, looking towards the north, you'll find the Big Dipper. And by following the edge of the Big Dipper towards the north, you'll find Polaris, which is 
part of the Little Dipper and also is the North Star. That way you'll always know where North is when you're out in the woods. If you want to find out more about our activities, our events, or just some of the things that are happening in Space News, please check out our website, www.astropontiac.ca, or visit our Facebook page by searching for Astropontiac. Thanks again, and clear skies.